Hello to all of our listeners. My name is Tofe, and today is another great day to be a social worker. Welcome to Social Work Amplified, a podcast hosted by SPEAK. SPEAK stands for Social Policy, Education, Advocacy, and Knowledge. And our mission is to amplify the voices of social workers by providing resources, increasing students' political engagement, and facilitating networking opportunities. Speak would like to gratefully acknowledge the generous support of the Simmons Sisters Fund at Texas Women's Foundation. I would like to introduce our guest for today's podcast, Greg Hinch. Hi, Greg Hinch. How are you? Hey, I'm doing well. Thank you. Appreciate you having me. Awesome. We're so excited to have you today. Greg Hinch serves as the Executive Director of National Association of Mental Illness, Texas. He joined National Association of Mental Illness, Texas in 2012, and he has served in the roles of public policy director and policy coordinator. In his current role, he is responsible for providing direction and leadership toward the achievement of National Association of Mental Illness, Texas's mission. He is a licensed master level social worker and a family member of a person with a serious mental illness. He received a master's degree in social work with a concentration in nonprofit and public management from Rutgers University and a bachelor's of art degree in government and politics from the University of Maryland. It's so awesome that you're an executive director and I'm so excited to learn a lot from you today and I'm pretty sure our listeners are also excited. Thank you. So I'm gonna go right into the first question and this is a question that I always want to know what led you to obtain a master's in social worker in social work after obtaining your bachelor's in government and politics. Sure. Yeah. Great question. Uh, so I um, did not have long term plans to become a social worker. It was something I I think I kind of just stumbled across as I um, moved through my undergraduate journey. I. I always knew I, I wanted to study government and politics. That was a, a passion of mine from an early age, something that I was always interested in. And uh, I was particularly interested in understanding more about how public policy and law can um, help improve the quality of life for vulnerable, marginalized populations. Uh, that was something uh, that I felt strongly about and I wanted to to learn more about. Um, I came from a, a, a fairly privileged background and, um, and, and was always curious uh, about um, how, you know, people who don't look like me or have the same resources as my, uh, as my family, how they, um, how they live and how they work towards their goals um, and how they proceed through life. So I wanted to have a better understanding um, of those realities. And I wanted to, to also know, you know, what can we do to empower people um, to, to, to realize their goals um, as they move through life. So um, I initially, my thought was I would study public policy uh, in grad school. I knew, I knew a graduate degree was the answer in terms of advancing a career in, in, in public policy. And so naturally, I, the first thought was, I'll go to a school for public policy, get a MPP or an MPA. Um, and uh, I uh, was looking into that, you know, junior, senior year of college and uh, took the GRE and, uh, and really struggled with the, the math portion, to be frank. Um, it just wasn't, uh, you know, something that I, uh, a skill set that I, I was very well groomed in at the time. And I think, you know, it turns out that uh, if you study public policy, um, at, at a, um, a professional school for public policy, there's a lot of quantitative analysis that, um, that, that goes into that field. And um, so it didn't end up being a good fit for me. So I looked into a plan B and um, found that social work is a field in which um, you, can, you can very much study public policy and public policy is, um, is a big part um, of what many social workers do. So I went, uh, 
you know, I went in that direction um, and um, moved back home uh, and started going to Rutgers. And, um, you know, two years later, I had my, my MSW and my social work license. Awesome. I was actually going to ask you, why didn't you go the public policy route? But, you know, based on your explanation, you're, you said that you wanted to empower people. And I think social workers, that's exactly what they do. We empower people and we are really community focused and community based. So I think the um, social work route that you went through, went to really like aligned with kind of like your desires and your vision for yourself. So what made you decide that you wanted to concentrate in nonprofit non and public management? Most universities actually don't even offer this option of such a concentration. So, you know, the fact that Rutgers offered this option, what made you decide that you wanted to focus on that? So uh, it, it was a, a fairly uh, easy choice for me in terms of uh, choosing my, my concentration or my track in social work grad school, there were only two options. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe one was called clinical and the other was nonprofit and public management. And I, you know, my hope was there would be a track that was uh, something, you know, had policy sort of integrated into the, the focus. And, and I would say nonprofit and public management did have uh, public policy as part of the uh, progression of coursework that, that you would take um, in that track. It wasn't readily apparent based on the title, um, but I knew, I learned that public policy was, was part of it. And I also knew, you know, if, when you think about public management and, you know, people who are in the field of public management are essentially practitioners of public policy and many nonprofits uh, do advocacy work. Um, and I had had, you know, volunteer experience with with nonprofit organizations uh, as an undergrad doing, doing advocacy. Um, so that seemed like a good way by choosing that track. Uh, it seemed like a good way to position myself for maybe an advocacy career, uh, a field, uh, a career working uh, in, in, within the government. Um, and, and so I was one of, you know, I think one of the relatively small group of people who went with the nonprofit and public management track instead of the, the clinical track and, you know, I would do it all over again the same way. I, I really enjoyed my experience focusing on nonprofit and public management at Rutgers. Awesome. So you work for the National Alliance of Mental Illness and it's a national organization and I know they do a lot, but can you tell us a little bit about the organization? What is it all about? And we wanted to hear from you since you are the executive over there. So can you tell us a little bit about that organization? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, it, NAMI is the acronym, National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, NAMI was founded in 1979 um, by a group of family members who were fed up with the fact that their loved ones were being failed by the mental health system, uh, if we could even call it a mental health system, in a lot of places, um, the, the the mental health system is um, so inadequate it barely exists. So these were passionate people. These were people, you know, with lived experience who said we want to make a change. Uh, and they, the way that it it all played out was that the the people who got involved with the original version of NAMI decided that educating each other uh, was key, supporting each other was key, and advocating for change was key. So NAMI, those are, those are the three things to this day that, uh, you know, more than uh, 35 years later, um, uh, oh, I guess more than 40 years later at this point, th those are the th three things that NAMI still does. We provide mental health education programs, um, to a variety of target audiences, primarily individuals who live with mental health condition and family members of, of individuals with a mental health condition. Um, you know, I think a lot of uh, families and individuals find themselves thrust into um, crisis situations and um, they, they may enter the mental health system in some capacity, but they don't get access to education delivered from a person who has had a similar experience. So 
we really believe that, you know, uh, tapping into people who have had experiences um, in the mental health system and with mental health conditions, you know, there's a lot of value in tapping into that wisdom and experience. So we have family members educating family members, individuals with mental health conditions educating other individuals. Secondly, we have support groups. Um, and, and then thirdly, we have our advocacy work. And um, that's been, uh, most of my time has been focused on that area um, where we advocate for change. We uh, develop a list of issues within mental health that we think should be addressed by decision makers and, and we push for those changes to be made. Um, and and, and the, the most important thing that we do to accomplish our goals is make sure that we have people with lived experience um, interfacing directly with decision makers um, so that they know what is, what is impacting uh, people across the state of Texas. Awesome. So NAMI, as you said, has three pillars, which is education, support, and advocating for change in all areas of mental health and to all people. I think that's an awesome organization and to think that it has existed for such a long time. I know like a lot of work went into like where it's at right now because like it's just right now in the past few years that we really see people talk about mental health and really focus on mental health and really like just be more aware that actually mental health is the real thing. So. I'm really, you know, very excited about the organization and what's gonna come from it in the future. So for upcoming social work students that might be interested in a position like yours, can you provide a brief insight into what you do overall or what a day looks like for you? Yeah, yeah, um, sure. You know, every day is a little different. Um, there uh, are many different projects that, that I'm involved with. Um, I think, you know, it, it, you could characterize my position as um, oversight of, of NAMI Texas to ensure that we're moving forward in a mission driven way. Um, so, um, you know, as executive director, I'm responsible for things like fundraising, um, grant management and, and, and uh, grant seeking, um, directing staff. Um, I have four um, staff members who, who report directly to me, um, and then um, supporting our board of directors as a nonprofit. Um, you know, we, we have a, an active working board, um, and so I provide a significant amount of staff support to them, attending committee meetings, um, writing reports, uh, and making sure that they have the tools that they need as, um, as board members to, to help us accomplish our goals. So, um, and then, you know, another you know, key aspect of the work that I do um, day in and day out is, is our advocacy work. Um, so that, you know, for my first seven or so years with NAMI Texas, that was what I did every day. Um, and that was the only thing I did was advocacy and public policy. Um, and so in that role, um, I would uh, frequently be at the Texas State Capitol. Uh, when, when the session was happening, I would be providing testimony um, I would be um, reaching out to legislative offices, visiting offices, um, and making the case that particular action should be taken on, on our priority issues within the realm of mental health. Um, and I still do, you know, uh, a significant amount of that um, to this day, even though I'm no longer public policy director. Um, it's important to me that I stay engaged on, on our public policy work. Um, and in part because we only have one full-time staff who uh, works on, on exclusively on policy. So there's, there, mental health is such a broad arena that, um, you know, we really need all hands on deck to accomplish our goals. Um, so I, you know, that um, advocacy work it remains front and center for me. And um, I think we've been able to get a lot done and, and create a lot of change in, in law and policy related to mental health. Awesome. It seems like your duties are both administrative and both boots on the ground. Like you have to be at the legislative sessions and things like that. You know, you can't just sit behind a desk, although sometimes you do have to do that in order to fulfill your you know, responsibilities. And it sounds like a good balance, a good mix of both, you know, administrative and like boots on the ground. And I actually wanted to ask you, like, did you did you see yourself being an executive director of NAMI? Or how did you like get into this position that you are currently in? Yeah, um, 
uh, it's funny you should ask, I, you know, for a long time, I, I um, actively resisted the, any thought of becoming executive director um, or any suggestion of me becoming executive director. I was not interested in the position. Uh, I liked the job that I had doing policy and advocacy full time. And, and um, I, you know, I, I will say, you know, executive director of, uh, of a small, largely grant funded statewide nonprofit um, with, that's a membership organization that's almost 2000 members, you know, it's a lot of work. It's, it's a hard job. And I, we don't, in this country, we don't necessarily set charity based nonprofit organizations up for success. Um, you know, they, they don't get uh, significant amounts of financial support from the government. Um, it's hard to secure and sustain donors. Um, we don't have, we don't value that industry, the nonprofit industry as much as other countries do. Um, and so it's a, it's a grind. It's a tough, it's a tough field. Um, it's a, it can be extremely rewarding. And, and um, you know, I love working in the nonprofit mental health care industry. I, I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, but the, you know, executive directors that I work with, you know, other NAMI state executive directors often feel pretty taxed and, and have a lot of, you know, concerns about how are we going to stay viable? How are we going to maintain relevance? How are we going to keep the lights on? So I didn't want, I, I said, I want no part of that. You know, that's, that's not for me. I like going to the Capitol. I, I like talking to media outlets, doing interviews on TV. You know, that, that feel, that's fun to me. That's what I always wanted to do. That was like my dream job, not being executive director, but circumstances change and opportunities present themselves. And, um, you know, it, I, I think fear of the unknown is natural. And I, that was why I pushed back, I think for a long time against the thought of becoming executive director, but I was offered the position and I was told you'll still get to do policy and advocacy work. Mm -hmm. And um, I decided to give it a shot. And, you know, I've been in that position for almost three years and uh, certainly, you know, it's had its ups and downs. I've had my fair share of, you know, setbacks, but, but we, we've, we've had a lot more wins than, than setbacks. And I learn more every day. Um, and I think I found ways to, um, you know, improve my performance and become a, a, a more effective executive director. It's you, you kind of learn as you go and, and um, try to re resist that feeling of, you know, imposter syndrome. I'm, I'm not capable of that. I don't have the skill set for that. You, you, you don't know until you give it a shot and you find, I think you learn a lot as you go. Awesome. So you got to get the best of both wor worlds while, you know, pursuing the executive director position. Mm -hmm. So aspiring social workers, we are always looking for ways to learn more, especially as we're still in school. And I saw that you participated in the Governor's Executive Fellowship. This is the first time I'm hearing about this fellowship. So can you tell us a little bit more about it? Sure. Yeah. So that that governor's executive fellowship that I had, and there there are two two fellowships I had that I like to mention. I think one's one's more relevant than the, than the other. Um, but the, the governor's executive fellowship was specific to Rutgers University, uh, and um, there's a, an institute there at Rutgers called Eagleton Institute of Politics. Um, it's a it's a really wonderful wonderful organization. And naturally, you know, being having major in political science and being interested in politics and policy. When I got to Rutgers, you know, I checked out Eagleton Institute right away. Um, and it turns out that they have uh, awesome fellowship programs there, both for undergraduates and, and, and graduate students. And um, you, you can apply and they, they link you up with um, an internship, usually in, in state government. And they, there's some specialized coursework um, and it was actually, it was a tremendous honor. I, I, it was one of the most valuable, you know, academic slash professional experiences I've ever had being part of that program um, it, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, you know, I, I was the uh, only social work uh, grad student in my cohort. 
my cohort of like 25, 30 students. So I was kind of the social worker of the group or the aspiring social worker of the group. Um, and, and so, you know, I, when I would go to the Eagleton classes, uh, the, the governor's executive fellowship classes, I would learn a lot. And then I would take those learnings back to uh, social work school in, uh, um, you know, I would have coursework like social welfare policy. And I, I was able to, you know, it helped me establish myself as a leader in the school of social work as someone who, who had a passion for and a knack for public policy. And then the second and perhaps more like um, uh, impactful uh, benefit of the governor's executive fellowship was that the internship that they linked me up with was with the uh, New Jersey Division of Mental Health and Addiction Services. Um, so that was like perfectly aligned with the area of public policy that I was most interested in. And I'm, I'm interested in mental health policy. I think people could probably tell by reading my bio because I have a couple family members who are impacted by mental health. So I, I wanted to focus on that area. Eagleton helped me out with a four month internship in New Jersey state government working on mental health. And I was able to parlay that into a job with, with NAMI Texas, um, a job which was in part a fellowship with the uh, Hogg Foundation for Mental Health at the University of Texas at Austin. So that was the, that was the second of two fellowships I had, the Hogg Fellowship. And, you know, wow, was that an incredible experience for me being a Hogg Policy Fellow uh, with NAMI Texas, per participating in the Hogg Policy Academy. Um, after I finished my, my two-year fellowship, I've subsequently been supervisor and mentor for um, three, uh, three policy fellows. So I've, I've been able to stay involved with that fellowship program for 10 years. And, um, you know, it's one, without question, the Hog Policy Fellowship at UT Austin was one of the best things that, that's ever happened to me. And, and, and it was a, the key factor in, in getting me to where I am today. Awesome. And can you tell us why mental health is important to you and like just for social workers in general? Because I know that like as a social work student, we know that mental health is important. We always say mental health is important, but why? Why do you think it is important? Well, it's, it, you know, it, it's uh, mental health is, is, is health, you know, it's just, a, it's another area of health. And um, we, you know, I think we often separate mental health from physical health. Like there's this arbitrary distinction um, that gets made between mental health and physical health. I, I always push back when I hear people say, you know, there are two types of health, mental and physical. You know, mental health is physical health. You know, the brain, the brain is part of the body. It's, a, mm -hmm. it's an organ that needs to be taken care of and nurtured, you know, just, just like any other. Um, in fact, you know, when you really think about it, I mean, the, uh, the brain is, has got to be one of the, the most important organs to our overall well-being. Um, it absolutely needs maintenance. Um, and we don't, you know, as a society, we don't tend to place as much emphasis or value on mental health as we do other aspects of health. You know, there, there's a lot of mental health stigma that's out there that keeps people from, from seeking care, that causes people to feel shame. And there, there isn't stigma for, for in that same way for, for other health conditions. So I think it's really important that we bring mental health out of the shadows, help people take care of themselves. Um, and remember, you know, uh, when you go and get your, you know, annual physical every year, um, it's just as important to get a checkup from, from the neck up as it is to get other, other parts of your body looked at by a healthcare professional. Um, and so, you know, without mental health, um, without, without um, that mental health being part of our overall well-being, I think people are going to have a hard time accomplishing um, their goals in life. People are going to have a hard time um, being empowered to achieve other things if they're not mentally well. And so that's, that's why I feel so strongly that we need to um, take a more um, aggressive, proactive approach to addressing mental health in our society. Thank you for that. That is really true. The brain is a very important part of the body. Like literally we couldn't even exist or do anything without our brain. So mm -hmm. why do we neglect that? Exactly. So just looking at your um, bio and your resume, 
I kind of like calculated it. And it seems like you've been a social worker for almost 10 years, if I'm correct. Yeah. And I don't know if you've ever worked in the micro um, field, but do you have a preference for like macro or micro social work? So, so I, as you know, you probably could tell from, from some of my other responses, you know, macro is, is the right place for me. Um, it, that may change. And I, I um, actually will say to myself sometimes, you know, um, I think it would be a really interesting, potentially valuable experience to um, try out or, or do more in the realm of micro social work at some point in my career, because I do find those um, more individual interactions um, with vulner vulnerable, marginalized people to be, you know, potentially very rewarding um, to, to see, you know, you can, you can more directly observe the impact of your work in micro social work, as opposed to macro where, you know, something you're advocating for probably doesn't even happen. And, and that's an important point is like most things that we advocate for ha still haven't happened yet. Like you only, you get your batting average in, in policy advocacy, macro social work is unfortunately not that high. No one's is. Um, and then even if we do get something over the finish line and we get the governor's signature on it, it could take years for there to be observable, measurable results, positive results from that form of social work. Um, so I, you know, that makes micro, it, that, that aspect of micro social work um, is appealing to me. And I have had some limited um, experiences in in, in, in micro social work, first and foremost, you know, my first field placement was at a public high school um, uh, on, on the child study team, meeting individually with students, helping them map out their goals and working on strategies to accomplish their goals. I love, love that internship. And I think about that internship a lot in the, the policy work that I do. I also had the opportunity to start a support group at that internship uh, for students with incarcerated relatives. Um, and that's, you know, I'm very passionate about criminal justice reform and, um, you know, that, that, um, experience of, of starting and facilitating that support group was, um, really invaluable for me and kind of informing my perspective going forward. There's one other experience in micro, um, you know, I guess like you could say the only other experience that meaningful experience in micro I've had was, uh, for a short period of time, I left the NAMI Texas staff and worked at Austin Clubhouse. Um, and clubhouses, for those not familiar, are a wonderful community-based um, mental health program. And there are clubhouses all over the world. Um, and, and so in that job, I was assistant executive director there, so I definitely had some macro uh, responsibilities, but I also um, had um, a, a significant amount of one-to-one of -one interaction with the members of Austin Clubhouse. And I loved it, found it very rewarding, but, you know, my skill set and, and my interests primarily lie in the macro realm. That is, that's true. And I really like when you said that, you know, working in the micro field, like it really allows you to like personalize other people's experiences so you can advocate from like, you know, a point where like you are really able to like personalize your advocacy. It's not just like general advocacy. It's more like not personal and intimate and you're really fighting for those people that need, you know, help. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. And, and I'll just, just tack one thing on, you know, and I, I alluded to this earlier, like our ability to make change in advocacy and macro is contingent upon our relationships in, in, in micro, uh, our relationships with people who are personally impacted by these issues. We won't be able to um, get the ball over the finish line in advocacy if we don't put a face to the issue that we're advocating for. So there is a, in the advocacy work that I do, there's a significant element of building, you know, relationships interfacing with family members, with people whose lives have been affected by mental health conditions. So there is, I think a lot of advocacy does have at least some level of micro to it. Awesome. Now we're gonna move on to our political questions. And I'm really excited about this part because you know I get to learn how you remain politically engaged and our listeners get to learn how you remain politically engaged. So there are many ways to be politically engaged. What are some of the ways you choose to remain politically engaged like outside of your 
day-to-day -day work? Yeah, that's that's a great question. You know, I, that's not not something I think about a lot, but I, I mean, it's it's kind of just part of who I am. So um, uh, there are some good examples of how I stay politically engaged. Uh, of course, I vote. You know, I've I've never missed an election. I stay informed on who the candidates are, what their positions are, the various issues. You know, there's there's no election too small or too big um, to engage in. They're all important because they're the decisions that get made impact our lives. So I'm an active voter. I also um, am passionate about empowering other people to engage in the democratic process. Um, one of my um, volunteer, uh, long time, you know, volunteer activities is voter registration. Um, so I'm a, a volunteer deputy, deputy voter registrar here in Travis County. Uh, and that means I go out um, into the community with my clipboard and get people um, registered to vote. Um, and in fact, I, the organization that I volunteered with um, is called Headcount, and they do voter registration. We do voter registration at uh, live music events, at concerts, so, you know, where we, we have plenty of those here in Austin. So I've registered hundreds of people to vote over the years, and um, it never gets old. Um, so I stay politically engaged in, in, you know, voting, being a voter myself, helping other people vote. Um, and, and then, um, you know, uh, reading the news, you know, staying up to date, listening to podcasts about politics and policy, um, just making sure that I'm an informed um, citizen, it, I think goes a long way to helping me, you know, kind of stay um, involved and, and active in uh, outside of my career and politics and policy. I, I also, you know, contribute to various uh, political candidates if I feel strongly about them. That's another great way, um, you know, to make our voice heard. Awesome. Monetary donations to political candidate, candidates, you know, voting, informing people. Those are all great ways to remain politically engaged. And I actually, like, I don't think I've heard the one of like monetary contributions. And that's actually a very significant one because like, Finances definitely keeps, you know, the candidate running. So what simple advice would you give to a social work student that wants to get involved in policy? Yeah, um, for, you know, just drawing on my experience, um, it was getting involved with organizations that are um, working on issues that I, that I care about. There are, you know, thousands upon thousands of grassroots, um, community-based organizations that do some level of advocacy. Um, so, you know, I mean, certainly in, in social work school itself, you have opportunities as a student to um, learn about and get involved in policy, your, your coursework, um, your, your internships, um, but then you also have campus groups um, you have nonprofit organizations. Maybe there might be one right down the street that you know is working on something that you care about. And so, if you if you seek them out um, as a student, I think you'll find you know there are like minded people who are out there you know doing work on issues that you care about. And and you know so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You 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 don't have to feel alone. You can um, do a little research and see you know who is who is out there already doing work on child welfare, who's, who's already doing criminal justice reform, um, and, and then reach out and say, you know, here, here's who I am, here's what my skill set is. Um, do you have any opportunities for me to get involved? I, I'll, you know, willing to volunteer my time. I think a volunteer position can often lead to a paid position. Um, so it's, you know, it's connecting with um, like-minded individuals and organizations who are already making progress and have built up momentum on, on advocacy work on issues that you care about. Awesome. That's really good advice. You don't always have to reinvent the wheel. I think it takes much more work to reinvent the wheel versus like, you know, just joining and joining forces with somebody that already has, you know, momentum, like you said. So uh, I think I'm gonna round up with this question. And this question is like a really exciting one for me. And I think for our listeners, just to see like what's your success 
in your personal pursuits are? So in your personal pursuits, in what ways have you seen your engagement in politics yield results in your area of practice? This can be like a minor success or a big success. You know, any, any success is a success. And, and is, this, is this relating to my career or pursuits outside of my career? It can be both. Okay. Be like whatever you have. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think in terms of successes in, in my work in policy and advocacy, the thing that I'm most proud of is our work on um, equity in uh, the health insurance space. Um, the uh, insurance industry um, has a history of, frankly, discriminating against people with mental health and substance use disorders. Um, and I think it's a, um, it's a pretty concerning civil rights um, violation, you know, when, when um, people with mental health conditions are being denied care um, by their insurance company at higher rates, um, or the insurance company is being more um, uh, punitive, being more restrictive, because, you know, with people with mental health conditions, substance use disorders, maybe insurance companies have an easier time denying a requested service by, let's say, a social worker, you know, a social worker might say, I think, I think this person really needs, um, you know, more than a, a, a week long stay in a residential facility, I think they need a 30 day stay. Um, and the insurance company, unfortunately, has all the power in that situation and can basically say, no, we don't, we don't think that that's medically necessary. And person, you know, gets admitted to the res residential facility, but they're back out on the street. Um, you know, seven days isn't, isn't necessarily enough to build a foundation of recovery. So we advocated um, for, um, you know, I would, for almost my entire time with NAMI Texas, we advocated for Texas to pass a law that requires insurance companies to be no more stringent, no more restrictive for mental health and substance use disorder coverage as they are for other physical health conditions. And that law finally passed in 2017. And now, you know, the playing field is much more level when it comes to mental health and substance use disorder coverage. Um, and, and one of the, um, the parts of that law that I've continued to be active within is that the parity law created the mental health uh, and substance use disorder parity work group. It's an official state agency advisory committee at our health state health agency. And I, I was appointed chair um, of that work group. And we spent four years, um, you know, side by side, uh, a couple years of, of the pandemic, um, working to develop a mental health and substance use disorder disorder parity strategic plan. It's the first of its kind in, in the nation. Um, and, and I think, you know, the fact that we were able to achieve um, that and, and, and achieve a law requiring full parity um, it is a huge accomplishment and something that, that I'm very proud of. And it has a positive impact on, on people's quality of life. That is very true. That is an awesome success story. Equity in insurance because like, I think a lot of people, especially with behavior health hospitals, we see like a revolving door. It's like the same people who were there one week is there again the next week because sometimes the insurance doesn't cover extended stays like you mentioned. So I think that's a great success story. And I really um, hope like for the future, you know, insurance companies, they will be more generous with, you know, what they cover and, you know, like maybe the average person can even just go in for a mental health checkup. They don't really have to have a diagnose, diagnosis to get, you know, that coverage. So I'm really excited about your success story. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Greg, for spending time with me today. Thank you to all of our listeners for joining us for another episode of Social Work Amplified. I hope you were able to learn something today that empowers you to become more politically engaged and helps you shape a better tomorrow. Until next time.